All right, good morning, everybody. Thank you for being with me today. Uh, I'll be honest with you, man. I've been really excited about getting over here this morning to share with you at the Digital Cathedral in this series that we're now two messages into called, or I guess maybe three messages into called, You Are a Creator. You're a creator. And I want to really plant vision this morning. There's some things I think that we're going to talk about that are going to help you in this progressive journey that we're learning how to create as a co-creator with the Father. Somebody asked me this week, should I just say I'm a creator or a co-creator? I, I, I like the term co-creator because I think it distinguishes us from those that would say we are source, that we are the God. Uh, I am one with the Father. We are in union together, but there is a distinction, and we work together to create all things. So for me, I like to say co-creator. All right, this morning, we're going to look at our second connector, our second bridge that takes us from invisible to visible. Let's, let's open up this morning, just get our thinking uh, going in the same direction. Let's open with a, a scripture, a little scripture passage from Colossians chapter 1. Let me pick it up with verse 12. I'm going to read down through verse 17. Colossians chapter 1, verse 17. Again, if you're with us for the first time today, you may want to go back and look at some of the previous teachings because what we're diving into is going to be tough for you to catch up with. You're a creator. All right, let's look at this. Colossians chapter 1, verse 12. It says, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us, he alone qualifies us, to be a partaker of the inheritance of the saints in the light. So part of the inheritance that we have that the Father has qualified us for is to be a creator. It's an area that has not been explored. I, I have not read anything in um, you know evangelical, charismatic, Pentecostal circles about being a creator. Most of what we have deemed creation or we have limited it to a prayer, a prayer life. And I don't know how your prayer life has been or was in the past, but mine has, was not that productive. It did not really get done what I was hoping that it would do. And I think there's some specific reasons for it. And part of what we're uncovering in this little series on you're a creator. So let, let, let's look at this. He's qualified us. He has delivered us, his work, entirely his work. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the son of love. So you and I are functioning now, not out of the kingdom of darkness, not out of a natural kingdom. We're functioning now out of the kingdom of God's son. We're functioning as the son in a kingdom, as the prototype son functions, so we function also. Then it just goes on to define it a little bit. It says, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him, all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth. Now watch, he has created all things that are visible and invisible. There are things that he's created that are invisible. And that's, that's what we're delving into. Everything that God has given you that pertains to life and godliness, probably you'd have to put in the category of the invisible. Things that you need right now are not visible, but they're already been created by the creator of all things visible and invisible. Where the thrones, dominions, principalities, powers, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things and in him all things consist. Well, we could spend all day on that 17th verse. In him, all things consist. You were never outside of being consistent within him. He's always, he's always embraced you, always held you. So when we get into this thing of being creator, uh, all that you need in the visible world has already been created. He said has already been created in its fullness in the unseen invisible realm that is called the kingdom. And that's where you're functioning today. This is a total kingdom function. Creating is an absolute kingdom function. And maybe you hadn't thought about it in this term, in these terms, but the kingdom is to us what the garden was to Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve had everything provided for them. Everything they needed to live a productive, full life was provided for Adam and Eve. Everything that you and I need to live an abundant, full life has been provided for us in the kingdom. Some of the things are visible. Some of the things are invisible. But we just read in Scripture that God created everything that is visible and invisible, and he did it. Check it out. He did it in six days. And after that six day, he entered into rest. And he's never come out of that position of rest. 
we live in the seventh day. That means it's not a day of labor. Creation is not a labor. Being a co-creator with the Father is not a labor. It's a coming together with him to bring what he's already created in the unseen into the seen realm, from the invisible to the visible. So we're living in that, that seventh day of rest. We co-create here on the planet with him and what we create, he has given to us as he did Adam in the garden. He's given things for us to enjoy, for us to take pleasure in. There's nothing wrong with creating good things that you desire, the desires of your heart. Delight yourself in the Lord. He'll give you the desires of your heart. How does he give you the desires of your heart? He helps you to co-create them. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that he's given us access to everything that he has created, and he's done it by what I call spirit connectors. I've never heard that. I've never heard or read that phrase any place, but I feel it's what the Father has revealed to me. He's shown me that we have connectors uh, from the invisible to the visible that we exercise and have exercised, but we haven't been aware of it. They are bridges from what we don't see to what we do see. That familiar verse of scripture in Matthew 6, 33 that you heard a gazillion times back in your uh, church days, Matthew 6, 33, seek first the kingdom of God and all these things and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. Well, how do they get added to you? We, I guess we just thought they flew out here from, from somewhere uh, in outer space and landed in our lap. That's how we thought they were added. We. Nobody ever really told us how they were added. I'm telling you this morning how they're added. You create them. Seek first the kingdom. Put yourself fully in a position. And we've talked so much about living out of spirit and not living out of, out of flesh or out of, out of soul. Don't live from five senses. That's the tree of choice, wrong choice, wrong tree. You and I live out of the tree of responding. We live out of the voice, what he shows us and what he reveals to us. And that's what this creative process is all about, just responding to his voice, responding to the mind of Christ, which you fully possess. So seek first the kingdom of God, his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. They are added. Could they possibly, just a question, could they possibly be added as you and the Father co-create together? Everything that we need, he's already created. And now, finally, we're learning how to access it. We're learning how to access it. We never knew how to access it. In fact, everything that we wanted from the Father was limited to prayer. And most of us spent years, if not decades, praying to God, asking, begging, pleading, arguing our case, setting out before him what we wanted. And it didn't produce much results. Could it just be, another question, could it just be that the Father was sitting back waiting for us to get quiet in spirit so that he could reveal to us that we are creators, that we can create, co-create with him in the natural, what he has already fully established in the, in the, in the spiritual or in the invisible. Now, we've never heard anything about this. I never heard anything all my life, and I've been a church guy all my life. I never heard anybody talk about co-creating. I never heard anybody talk about how to bridge the uh, natural with the spiritual or how to bridge the unseen with the seen or the visible with the invisible. Father created, listen to me, Father created all things. All things have been created, and now this generation is learning how to access those things, how to create in the visible whatever is fully created already in the invisible. So last week we looked at the first connector, and I'm laying these out in sequence for you, and I'm examining each of them for a week. When I first started this message, I kind of gave you an overview of all of them, and then I wanted to come back and just spend a week on each of them, which still isn't going to do them justice, but it will take us down another layer. So last week, we talked about the first spiritual connector, the first bridge that you and I have between the visible and the invisible, between what we see and what we can't see, and it's called a thought. All creation starts with a thought. There isn't anything that you see. There is nothing that has ever been created that did not begin, that did not have its origination in a thought. A thought is the starting point of 
creation. And if you didn't, if you were, didn't listen to the teaching from last week, you need to get it because each week we're building in sequence from start to finish this process of being a co-creator. So the mind of Christ should be what you possess fully, Paul said. You, it all begins out of the mind of Christ, the thoughts that he generates within you, a renewed mind, a mind of the spirit, a mind that responds to the, to the voice and not the choice. So everything begins with a thought. And I spent a whole, whole teaching on that last, last week. So go back and listen to that. Um, the second connector, the second bridge is what I want to talk to you about this morning that takes us from the visible to the invisible and from the unseen back to the seen is your imagination. Your imagination. This is such a big area, such a huge topic. I'm not going to do it justice this morning, but just like with thought, I'm going to, I'm going to take it down a notch. I'm going to dive a little bit deeper, but I want to reserve the right to come back I probably should do a whole series on imagination. That's how important it is. I told you at the start of this series that every one of these connectors, when I'm on them, I'm going to tell you they're, mo they're the most important because that's, I don't think you can um, shortchange any of them. You certainly can't shortchange a thought because that's the start. Now, the imagination is highly, highly important in this process. The imagination works closely with our thoughts. They're both products of the mind. <clears throat> but I, I make it, uh, I merismos them, I separate them because what they produce is different even though they come from the mind, the same source. So the desire of what we want to create starts with a thought. Have you got that? It begins with what you really want, specifically a specific thought not generalized, you need to make a specific thought. I covered that last week. Now the imagination picks up that specific thought and the imagination, the job of the imagination then is to give it form, to give it structure. It draws, the imagination draws the complete picture of what the thought had planted. Are you with me? The imagination is the realm where all things are possible. Your imagination is not limited by anything. Your imagination is not limited by words. It's not limited by thoughts. It's not limited by what other people tell you. Your imagination has no limits to it. It's where you can visualize what the natural eye would say there's no way. It's impossible. The natural senses would say it's impossible. Yet the imagination, when the imagination takes the thought and begins to develop it, it can develop it to the fullest that it desires to in the imagination. The imagination is where your believer gets activated. This is where your believer gets stirred up and you start to believe maybe this thing could, could be real. Jesus said this in, in uh, what is it, Mark chapter 9 and verse 23. He said, all things are possible to him that believes. Where does the believer, I'm not talking about a person, but your believer, that, that little believer that's down inside of you, where does that believer get sparked to believe all things are possible? In your imagination. When your imagination begins to form this, you get excited about it. When your imagination begins to fill in the blanks, it, you begin to, uh, you begin to put a hold on this. We call, we could call it vision. Imagination is vision. Same thing. Same thing. If, if you cannot see it in your imagination, then what you do is you put a kink in the creative process. It stops right there. The five physical senses would like to abort the creative process wherever it can because the five physical senses would like to control your life. Your soul would like to control your life. So your, your five senses look at what appears and tells you that's reality. A thought that develops in imagination is not limited by what you see physically. Imagination is visualized. It's visualized. The imagination must see the thought. Here's what imagination does. Imagination takes the thought and sees it like a skeleton. He's got, he's got the basic idea, the thought. Then the imagination puts flesh on the skeleton. It begins to build on that skeleton every detail. 
every detail. And when you're exercising your imagination in this creative process, you want to put everything into that that's possible. Exactly, exactly what you would desire. Exactly. Make it minute. Draw it as finely tuned as you possibly can. That is, that's something we never heard in the Word of Faith movement. Now, the Word of Faith movement, we picked up some stuff in it, and it basically revolved around finding something in God's Word that we want, and then stand, we called it standing on the promises, and then we just confess, 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 and claim, and claim, and claim. It didn't work real well, because it missed some of the, the process. And one of the huge steps of the process we never learned about in the Word of Faith is this thing of imagination. We were afraid of imagination in Word of Faith, because it kind of aligned itself, we thought, with new age. But the Bible's full of, of, of imaginations. When uh, God walked Abraham out and showed him the, the stars of the sky and said, your descendants will be like, he was building imagination, took him out and said, as just as the sands of the sea, the little grains of the sea, your descendants will be, he's building imagination. He had already planted the thought that in him all nations would be blessed. Now he's giving him an imagination. The scripture's full of imaginations, and we're going to look at one in, in just a minute, because imagination is what makes it real. It brings it into that sense to where you can begin to get a hold of it. So again, again, when you're in this phase of imagination, you want to make this baby just as, as, as precise and as real as you can. That's why it's important that you have a specific thought. You need to give the imagination something to work with. He has to have something to work with. So the mind of Christ gives us the thought. The mind of Christ tells us what we, what we uh, potentially should be able to create if that's the desire. See, our desires in the mind of Christ are one. Don't separate this. Don't think, well, you know, only the mind of Christ is going to have me create these spiritual things. It's only going to, no, he's very practical. He looks at what you would really like, and your, your desires are his mind. When you walk in spirit, when you follow the voice and not the choice, then your desires are the mind of Christ that are speak, that's speaking to you. And he's telling you it's okay if you want, <clears throat> you want that house. It's okay if you want that job, that education. That, that's him coming up within you to help fill in the plan that he's always had for your life. It's not selfish to want a promotion. It's not selfish to want to make more money because that's that's opens up doors of opportunity for you to continue to express the kingdom and for the kingdom become to become visible. So our Christ consciousness, our Christ-centered consciousness works within us. The mind of Christ gives us the thought. We think it's just what we want. We think it's a desire. And your flesh will tell you that's just selfish. No, it's not selfish. If he deposited it within you, then you can go for it. Then the Christ consciousness begins to work within us and defines it. It develops it. It draws a picture of what we desire to create according to the blueprint of the Father. And again, let me say, there's nothing that you want in the natural that has not already been created in the spiritual. There's nothing that you can want in the seen that the Father did not create in six days in the unseen. Let me blow your mind. Let me blow your mind for just a minute. Your imagination may be, just may be, the most image of the Father that you possess. That part of you may be the most most precise like the father. Your imagination of anything that you that you that you possess because within within your imagination all things are possible. See the angel comes to Mary and says with man it's impossible. With God all things are possible. Then we just read where Jesus said all things are possible to him that believes. Believing is a function of the imagination. The imagination gets a hold of it, and we begin to believe that, doggone it, this, this might just could happen. So that imagination is correlates so closely and fits the pattern of the Father. I think he put our imagination within us to help us grasp the bigness of, of himself and relate it to our imagination. And I hope I'm making sense this morning. So when you exercise your imagination, it's not some new age exercise. It's taking 
your identity as divinity and beginning to exercise it and draw the picture of the thing that you desire to co-create. Our, our imagination is highly undeveloped. It's highly undeveloped. We've not exercised imagination. We, like I said, we have shied away from it. It hasn't been used and it hasn't been developed under the direction of our Christ consciousness. Or we think, you know, imagination is not realistic. We take our imagination, we pass it through the filter of logic and reason, and it doesn't pass through. Logic and reason will say, man, what you're imagining is just too far out there. It'll, it'll never happen. It can't be. Yet your imagination believes that all things are possible. We, we shy away from it. I was thinking this week how when I was a, when I was a kid, you know, 9, 10, 10, 12 years old, how much I daydreamed. Did, we daydream when we're kids. As we get older, I don't daydream like that anymore, but I would daydream. I would take a trip and never leave the house. That was my imagination working. But as we got older, we, we squelched that imagination. See, my imagination... <clears throat> I mean, I loved baseball. Anybody who knows me knows I loved baseball. I played it all through high school, played it in college. That was my game. I was too small and too slow to play football beyond high school and too short to play basketball. So baseball was my game. And I would daydream about playing in the major leagues. I would daydream. I remember going out in the front yard and I had had a ball bat. And I would picture that the, the, the tree, which was on a little mound in the front yard, I would I would use my imagination that that's, that's the pitcher, man, and he's smoking them in there. And I'm just connecting. I am connecting and driving pitch after pitch out of the ballpark. I, I would, I would, there were the trees on our, on, on the lot that we had. And I would pretend like one tree was first base, one tree was second base. And I'd take my lead off, off first. And I would steal second base and I'd slide into that tree. It was all imagination. But I saw myself in that position. And I think that might be one reason why I played baseball as long as I did is because when I was a kid, I developed my imagination and I believed it was possible. Nobody in my family ever played any college sport. I was the first one in, it, 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 remote to my family that ever played a college sport, but I visualized myself doing that. And I think that played a big part in creating that ability to be able to go that far. So imagination, I think, is that part that is divinity of us as much as any other part of us, certainly, because it correlates so much to the impossible as the Father relates to impossible. Our imagination is undeveloped, man. We need to get back. We need that's what meditation does, really. When you meditate, you're day, you're going to start daydreaming. Thoughts are going to come to you. You're going to develop those in your meditation. And that we were as a kid, we call that daydreaming. And we could we could access that realm just that quick. Just that quick. You could daydream a lot. But now that I'm, you know, now that I'm an, an old man, I don't I don't daydream. Now, if, when I contemplate, I do take a trip. I can take a trip contemplating, meditating. I can put myself into a situation that is daydreaming almost. And I think you understand what I'm saying. But we need to get back to developing that. And we develop it around the thought that has been planted in us, which represents the desire specifically of the thing that we want to co-create, knowing that the Father has already co-created it or created it in the invisible and is now waiting for us not to pray, beg, plead our case. He's waiting for us to team with him and begin to get the thought and develop it with our imagination. Okay. Now, some of you are going to run out and try to try to work this whole thing right off the bat before we ever get to the end of the process. And you know what? Each of these connectors will function to a degree, but they're not going to function with the, with the weightiness that I want them to function until you let me get through all of them. But the imagination is important. Watch how Jesus used thoughts to develop imagination in the disciples. Okay, I, I, I used this a couple of weeks ago, so it's kind of familiar to you in John chapter four. But let me let me carry it just a little bit further this morning because I, I really want you to turn your imagination loose. We're going to have to turn our imagination loose if we want to co-create. Imagination draws, it takes, it takes the bare bones of the thought and it dresses it entirely. It takes the nakedness of the thought and puts clothes on it. It takes the skeleton and puts the flesh on it. It takes the paint by number and fills in all the numbers so that the picture now becomes 
absolutely complete. All right, John chapter 4, let me pick it up with verse 34, almost there. John chapter 4, verse 34. <clears throat> Watch how Jesus does this. Jesus was an expert at this, at taking a thought and developing the imagination. Verse 34, Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish the work. So Jesus said, I, I've, I know what the Father has sent me to do. I have a thought. And now he bring, he's going to bring the disciples in, into the finished work that he's completed. He's going to give them a vision to carry this finished work on, to, to create within them, to create a desire that they could go and do what he did as well. So the thought is his finished work. The thought is, guys, I know what the, the, the word of the Father is. It's to do his will. That's what really feeds me and to finish it. He had a vision to finish it. He had an imagination that worked to finish it. We're going to look at another scripture about the imagination of Jesus already seeing it finished in just a minute. But let me just show you how he drew it out for the disciples. Verse 35. Do not say there are four months and then comes the harvest. Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes, look at the fields, for they are already ripe with harvest. So he, he draws them in by painting a picture for them to see in their thoughts. <clears throat> now, whether there was actual fields, I don't know. I don't think so. There's no indication there were actual fields there. Jesus is putting a thought in their mind, and then he's developing in their imagination. I think that's exactly what's going on. I don't think there were necessarily fields, and he's, he's saying, look, look at these physical fields. I think he's doing this in spirit. He's saying, guys, my, my, my meat is to do the will of the Father and to complete his plan, his will for my life. Now he brings them in, and he says, guys, I want you to get a picture of this. I want you to get a picture of fields that are ready to harvest, because when I finish the work, all you got to do is do the harvesting. He said, don't say it's going to be in another generation. Don't put it way down the line somewhere. He said, I want you to visualize it. I want you to see it. It's happening now. It's happening down. All right, let me read on. Verse 36. <clears throat> and he who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit. He's drawing imagination here of eternal life that both he who sows and he who reaps rejoice together. For in this saying is true. One sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you have not labored. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor. Wow, Jesus is really drawing a picture here. Jesus is creating a harvest coming to them that they never saw before. He's painting a complete picture of this. So what Jesus, Jesus saw this in the invisible. So now he gives the thought to the disciples and he wants them to see in the invisible, the same thing that he's seeing. The mind of Christ is working within the disciples. Jesus is trans, translating a thought to them. He's planting a seed. He's planting a seed of creation, just like he does with us. The mind of Christ plants seeds in you of what is to be created, just as real as what he's doing there. So he plants the thought in their imagination, and now they see what they never saw before. They see it. In their imagination, they see it. They see it. Jesus defines this even down to letting them know that it would not be their efforts. Oh, this is so important. This is good. That it would not be their efforts that completed the, the creation. It would not be their working, their sweating, their toiling that made this thing happen. And that's what we've got to understand in this creative process. That's why I like to say it's co-creating. We're entering into his rest. We're entering into what he has fully completed. Now we're imagining it. We're seeing it as so. He's saying to them, this comes out of a full position of rest. In, in other words, this creative process that's going on, that we're learning how to be a creator, it is totally an inside job. It is not where we have to rush out and try to make it happen. That's what we did for years in religion. We would pray to God, then we would act like everything depended on us. Matter of fact, people even taught that. Pray to God, but then act like everything depends on you. That's crazy. Why, why pray to him if everything depends on you? He's telling him, look, guys, this does not depend on you. You're going you're gonna to reap in fields you did not sow in. You're going you're gonna, to you're gonna gain things for which somebody else labored. Your thought and your imagination are closely associated. 
And in just those couple, three verses of scripture, Jesus does both, plants the seed, develops the imagination. When I'm done with this six week series, I, I'm making it very methodical right now. That's the way I teach. I, I'm very methodical, one, two, three, four. So we're taking the steps of the creative process very slow, we're coming through it methodically. What you're gonna find happen is, when this becomes um, like anything else, when it becomes familiar with you, it becomes second nature, the process will all blend together and the thought, the imagination, and the other two steps that I'm still to cover, they'll just begin to form one, one creative process. But when you're starting, right now where I'm at, is I, I see them individually and I know when I'm passing through one step to the next. For me, it's a very conscious effort now to have the thought. And then I move it to the imagination. You know, I've relayed to you some things that I know have come out of a creative process. So I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go over those again, <clears throat> but I, I I'm making a point that for me where I'm at in my development with this I'm not where it's all just flows easy fast. I have to still see the process and pass through the process. But it's getting more familiar, and I can I can now with my imagination see how Jesus was so highly developed in this that the thought, the imagination, and step three and four all just flowed together in a matter of minutes. See, right now I'm waiting for the things to appear sometimes, but I think that we can develop this to where it just happens quickly, happens very quickly. So the, 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 the mind and the imagination are very closely associated, but just for this, for this series, I'm making a distinction. They're both a function of the mind, and they're, they're what I would call, I guess I would call these the power twins of creation. These are the power twins of being a creative agent, the mind and the imagination. They work very closely together. Now, if you, if you don't have a thought, if you don't have a thought of what's your desire that is specific, that is specific. If, if you just say, well, uh, then the, well, before I get to that, let me say this. If you don't have a thought that's specific, then the imagination has nothing to work with. There's no skeleton. The thought has to be specific so that when you pass it to the imagination, it has a, a, a something it can get a hold of that it can paint a clear picture. It can paint, paint, you can visualize it. If the thought is just random, if the thought is not specific, for example, if you desire to create a car, you're looking at your car and say, you know what, I really need a new car. I need, I, I, I don't really think I can afford it. Uh, but I, I just need a car. Um, I've been thinking about changing jobs. Um, I could sure use a raise. Um, um, I'm tired of being sick. I would like, I'd like to be healed. See, those are not specific thoughts. Those are not specific, specific thoughts. You've been thinking of changing jobs. All right, now we need to make the thought specific. What kind of job do you want? What kind of a job do you want? Um, you've been thinking about getting a new car. I've been, thinking about getting a blank car, right? I've been thinking about getting, what do you want? A Chevrolet, a Hyundai, Cadillac, Mercedes? It doesn't really matter to him. You can have whatever kind of car you want, but the thought needs to be specific. Uh, I could use a raise. Well, what kind of raise are you looking for? How much of a raise do you want? That needs to be the thought. I'm tired of being sick. I want to be healed. Well, what exactly do you want to be healed of? You might be surprised when you begin to get a specific thought, what it actually is that you need to be healed of, it might not be what the symptoms have portrayed to you when you get down below the surface and the mind of Christ feeds to you a thought of what it is you need to create. But the point is this, those are not specific thoughts. There's nothing there for the imagination to develop. We need a specific thought. What kind of job, what kind of car, what kind of race, what kind of wellness do you need? When God said, all right, when God said, let us make man, that was a specific thought. He didn't say, let us, let us make something that will function on the earth. Let's, let's make something that, you know, will inhabit the garden. No, he was very specific. And then after, after the thought came, the, God passed that thought to his imagination and he then drew the picture and, um, let me show you in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Let's go way back to the beginning of the book. 
Genesis chapter 1 and verse 20, 26. See, the reason I think this works is because it fits the pattern of the Father. And, and this is the way God created. So when he calls you in to be a co-creator, it's going to fit the same pattern. Because you're in his image and in his likeness. So in verse 26 of chapter 1, he said, let us make man. That's the thought. That's the thought. Let us make man. Now, what is this man going to look like? How's this man going to function? What, what, what is this man all about? He says, according to our likeness and our image. And he says, let them have dominion. He's starting to draw the visualization. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air. You, you, know, you know what he said. So in verse 27, it says, God created man in his image. And in the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. Then God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful, be multiplying. He, this is all imagination of God. Because the man does not appear till chapter 2, verses 5, 6, and 7, when God forms him out of the clay and breathes into him the breath of life. And that man functioned exactly, was to function exactly like the imagination of God constructed it. And the imagination of God constructed the man out of the thought, let us make man. But he didn't materialize till chapter 2, verse 5, 6, and 7. I'm trying to, I'm trying to get you to see that oftentimes there is a time span. How long it was from Genesis 1, 26, 7, 8, and 9 to Genesis chapter 2, 5, 6, and 7, I have no clue. I don't know what the time span was. But the point is this, between the thought and the visualization and the last two steps, which we'll get to, when we end that, there could be a time before it actually shows itself. It, it did with God. It wasn't an immediate thing. See, a lot of people have been confused about two creation stories in Genesis 1, Genesis 2. It's not two stories. It's one story. It's the story of God creating man in his mind, in his imagination, in his thought process before he ever shows up. So the, the, the creation, is it's amazing. The creation looked exactly like what he fully developed in his imagination. For imagination to hit on all eight cylinders, there's two things that you have to really know. So as you begin to function in imagination, I want you to understand this. All right, these two things. For imagination to work, there's two things that you're going to have to really nail down. First of all, you got to know what it is you want to create. You got to know what the desire really is specifically. Make it and make it real in your imagination. Make it real. How would it feel when this thing shows up? You, got, you, you, you need a new car. How would you, and you decide, I want, a, I want a Chevrolet Impala four-door. I want it blue. I want leather seats. I want, I want to put Cirrus radio in there. Um, I want, I want, the, I want the, the, the better wheels. I mean, you get this, I want chrome exhaust. Um, I mean, you get this whole thing visualized. How are you going to feel? When you sit in that brand new car, cars, brand new car's got a great smell to it. Nothing like a new car smell. How's that car going to smell? How's it going to feel when you start driving a car that um, the front end is out of alignment? It's not smoking. It's not, it's not on its last leg. How's that going to feel to you? How, how's it going to look? What would, what would it be like to be in possession of that car, to actually see it right now? How, see, that's what imagination does. In your imagination... You bring the fullness of the thing into the now. That's what imagination does. Thought plants the seed, the specific, the specific seed, whether it's corn seed, uh, wheat, uh, watermelon, whatever it is. The, the, the seed is specific. But then the imagination draws the picture in its absolute fullness. Jesus functioned in this all the time. Now, we've said how many times, as he is, so are we in this world. If he functioned this way, then you and I have got to function. And Jesus created some unbelievable things. People called it a miracle. Jesus never said, I'm going to do a miracle. Jesus created. I, I'm, I'm more I read, the more I'm convinced Jesus did not heal people. That was the observation. What Jesus did was created wellness and wholeness in the life of people, of other people. And as we develop in this, I think that door is going to open to us. But for right now, we got to get proficient at creating for ourselves. And that's not selfish. That's that's not egocentric. That's not egotistical. It is it is walking in the manifestation as a son of God. And when you begin to create, other people are going to see that power that you have to create, and they're going to be drawn to the gospel. It is lifting up Jesus. 
It is lifting up Jesus. Uh, Jesus exercised this in <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 12. Look, look at Jesus here. Hebrews chapter 12. I'm glad you all know your Bible so well because when I take it and begin to lay it out for you in, in some new ways, maybe you hadn't considered, you're able to see it. You're not going to resist it. In, in chapter 12 and verse 2, he has a thought and the imagination develops it. Watch this. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, not despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now the thought was this. I've, my meat is to do the will of the Father and to complete it. Now the imagination went to work. The imagination went to work. The imagination saw for the joy that was set before him. So he imagined the joy that was set before him. He imagined the joy of it is finished. He imagined how it would feel. He imagined what it would be like. He imagined what it would be like then to ascend back to the right hand of the Father. He got a picture of it in his mind. And this is what he held on to. For the joy that was set before him, he went through a lot of garbage. And once you get the, 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 the thought and the imagination highly developed, you can go through a lot of junk till it shows up. Doesn't matter because you're not moved by that stuff because your imagination has brought it. Listen to me. Your imagination has brought it into the now and you can seize it. It is just as real for you in your imagination as it is when it actually shows up. Are, are you with me? He saw the world as, as he saw the creation of all things that he, he died to give to us. He, he wasn't moved by all that took place around him. He endured it. He went through it. He saw the work as doing. He saw the, 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 the creation of all things being rescued. He saw the reconciliation of the cosmos. He saw that in his imagination. Now, the senses tried to discourage that. So I, a couple of weeks ago, I talked to you about, is I am natural or spiritual? If you're, and I said, you got to make a decision that's going to be spiritual because the natural is going to try to abort this creation every step of the way because the senses want to control your life. They do not want to submit. They do not want to submit to spirit. So the senses will try to get you to accept appearance. The contradictions that came to Jesus, who for the joy he set before me endured the contradiction. The contradictions tried to say, Jesus, this ain't going to work. Jesus, you're not going to reconcile all of the cosmos. You're not, you're not going to rescue all of humanity. His senses were battling against him. The centerpiece of imagination if you missed everything I said, I want you to hear this. The centerpiece of imagination is the desire fulfilled. That's what imagination sees. The, the, the imagination sees the manifestation of the creation. It sees the things that are not seen, and that holds to the evidence. Imagination is where you have the thought that is now true. It is now as real as real can be. So our Christ consciousness is going to keep us focused. If, you, if you'll stay in spirit, stay in Christ consciousness as your imagination paints the picture. Always remain Christ-centered. That's where it separates us from new age and, and metaphysical thinking is we remain Christ-centered. Imagination is not subject to facts. That's the power of imagination. It's not subject to facts. It doesn't care what facts bring to you. It's not, it's not subject to the words of others, or it's not uh, submitted to the thoughts that try to exalt themselves against the knowledge of the thought and the imagination that God has planted within you. Remember the creator of the cosmos. He lives in you. He's not out there. Creator of the cosmos. We read it in Colossians chapter 1. In him all things consist. Creator of the cosmos lives in you, and he is the one that inspires your thoughts, okay? So in fact, in fact, let me, let me just throw this out there. In fact, I really think he is your imagination. He's the one that paints the picture when you have the handoff from the thought. In fact, from start to finish, this is all God working as you, in union with you. 
Now you are one with distinction. I never want to leave that distinction. You are not the source. You are not Jehovah, you, Shama, Jaira. You, you are not that, but you are I am. And everything I am comes out of I am that I am. So we work at this together. We co-create this. In, in, in fact, he's your imagination. He's working there. He is your thoughts. The mind of Christ is your thoughts. Now, what we get to next week, we're going to see how he works in that dimension also. So the first thing that we want to make sure of, and let, let, let me just let me just repeat this because I want you to absolutely uh, have this down in your imagination. You need to know what you want. You need to know what you want. Now, the second thing that is imperative for your imagination is this. You need to think from and imagine from the end product, not trying to get to the end product. That's what imagination is for. Imagination is to produce this thing in the end form. Now take your time with imagination. Our imaginations are very undeveloped. This Don't just throw them at two minutes of thought together on your imagination. Don't let your mind just run for a couple of minutes. You might want to make imagination last for a, a period of days or even weeks because you want this thing precisely, exactly as you want it. Because what, what you think, what you imagination produces is eventually going to manifest. So you don't want to do a face palm and say, man, I wish I'd imagined this on there because now you really could have used that. You need to, to be thorough in your imagination. You don't imagine power windows. You get a car. I guess I don't probably have anymore. Those hand cranks. I'm showing my age. Those hand cranks say, man, I wish I'd imagine power windows in this car. And that's just a simple illustration. But you see what I'm saying. Take your time. Let the imagination fully develop and see it from the end. Imagination as it adds all the feelings, all of the emotions. It sees it done. It sees it finished. That's what Jesus was doing. Jesus in his emotions, in his thoughts, in his imagination, he saw the work that he came to do as being fully accomplished, fully done, fully completed. He saw the world saved before before he ever went to the cross. He saw us in perfect form. And I, when I talk about saved, I'm not talking about ticket to heaven. I'm talking about sozo. I'm talking about us being fully restored, fully whole, fully upright, fully as we should be in our consciousness. He, he saw that. The better you define it in your imagination, the easier it is to see it as a finished creation. Let me run that by you again. The better you define it in your imagination, the stronger it gets in your imagination, the more precise it gets in your imagination, the easier it is for you to see it as a finished product because you see it in its completeness. Imagination supplies the evidence of what you don't see with your natural eyes yet. Yet. Imagination sees it as so. So let me say this in conclusion. Let me wrap this up. Here's what I want you to see today. We're just taking one layer off of this, and I got a whole lot more to say about imagination because I really think it's it's your hookup to, to divinity. I think this is the part of you that has really been created in the image and the likeness of God. And it is in the image, the likeness we've not developed in our imagination, and we're now developing it. I want you to see imagination as you see thought. I want you to see it as a bridge from the visible to the invisible, a bridge from uh, what you see to what you don't see. I want you to see imagination as reaching out there in the unseen and bring it to the scene. I want you to see it reaching out into the invisible and now in your imagination, it's totally visible. Imagination, here's what I want you to take away. Imagination brings the thought of what you desire to create, inspired by the mind of Christ, from the unseen to where the imagination fully sees it as completed. And let me say it again. Most don't take the time to really exercise their imagination because it's a brand new area. We haven't done that. That's all new age stuff. Don't, stay away from that. Know the Bible's full of it. <laughs> but God worked by imagination and so did Jesus. Remember, you never, you never create anything unless it first is a thought that is passed to the imagination. And we say imagination fully develop this, fully get this perfect, fully get it right. 
Now, next week, we're going to look at connector number three. And when I'm doing number three, I'm going to think it's the most important one. And it is highly important. If, if you abort this in the third connector, the whole, the whole abortion, the whole process, the whole creation is going to be thrown on the scrap heap. So you don't want to miss next week. We're through our thoughts. We're through imagination. And next week, we'll get to number three, which is a vital part of the process. All right. God bless you guys. Thank you for being with me this morning. Uh, we've taken this down another layer. I've given you a lot to think about. As always, I encourage you to go back and listen to this a second time. And when you listen a second time, take a notepad out and just make some notes. Make some notes on things that stick out to you and then think about it. Crockpot it. Meditate it. Again, don't believe it because I'm telling you, if it doesn't resonate within you, then just set it aside. You might not be ready for this. It, you might not be ready to create. But if you're ready to create, take some notes, think about it, and be ready to, to uh, hook it up for next week when we get to connector number three. Again, thank you for praying for me. Thank you for contributing, for supporting, being a part of. It's highly, deeply appreciated. And without you, we couldn't do all that we're doing. God bless you. See you Wednesday night at The Secret Place and back next Sunday morning for our next chapter of You Are a Creator. You got it? God bless. Have a good week.